All right. Uh, Romans chapter number 12 tonight. And uh, Romans 12. And I'm going to look at verse number 2. Uh, but I'm going to start out, of course, in verse number 1. You can't, you can't have verse number 2 without verse number 1. And, uh, but what I'm going to look at tonight is how to grow. Now, this morning we looked at how to grow in the good ground, right? How to grow your family for God in the good ground. Now, sad thing is this morning it did not record. I'm hoping it's going to record tonight, but... Anyways, but this morning I preached on how to grow your family in the good ground. We looked at the four grounds, amen, the sower and the seed. We look at where the seed, now what do we see in the typology of that, okay? The sower was who, church? Sower is who? God. God's the sower, right? In, the, in this parable, God's the sower and the seed is the Word of God. A and the soil is who? It's us, Amen. And so we find four different types of soil. And what the blessing is about this parable is, is that God sows the seed on all types of grounds. No one is exempt from the gospel, amen? No one is exempt from the word of God. No one is exempt from the seed. And he, and, he, and he sows the seed on all types of ground, amen? And we looked at, first of all, the, 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 the wayside, where the fowls of the air, which, uh, which Jesus likens that to the devil, the fowls of the air, came and devoured the seed, amen? Before it got to the heart, he, he stole it from the heart of the people, amen? And then the, and then the seed number two is, or ground number two, is, is among the rocks. And, and the Bible said that the seed fell... And it took root and began to sprout. But it had no real root to it because it lacked moisture. It was upon the rocks. You ever pull weeds in the rocks? It's easy to pull, right? Ain't got much, uh, much effort to pull the weeds if it's a bunch of rocks. Why? Because that seed is growing among the rocks, not under the rocks. Amen? Uh, we have out here in our, in our uh, flower bed, we lay down that that, that non-growing pad before we put in the rocks. And over a period of time, you got dirt and dust and all, and it accumulates on top of the rocks or within the rocks. And then, of course, because of pollination and the way God created everything, some of the seed will fall among the rocks. And so you'll have weeds along the uh, rocks, but it's easy to pull because there's no root. And then we've seen that the seed fell among the thorns. Now, the thorns is, the t is, is of the curse. It's the type and picture of the curse. And, and the weeds and the thorns. And, and, and what happens is, is that the seed, it took root. It began to grow. But as it grew, the thorns began to grow up along with it and choke it. And Jesus says, those are all the cares and the riches of the world. The thorns. And, and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll allow those thorns to grow up along uh, amongst us and choke us from growing. And of course, the fourth ground is the good ground. And the Bible says that the good ground with a good, honest heart began to grow. But here's the key thing. Remember those two words? Who remembers the two words? Here's the key thing about growing in the good ground. You've got to what? Keep it. And the Bible says keep it. And that's not saying, oh, I've got to hold it to myself. I've got to protect it. No, that's not what it's saying. The word keep it, it goes back to the book of Genesis where God instructed Adam to dress the garden and what? Keep it. That means to cultivate it. That means to work it. So in our Christian life, as we begin to grow in the good ground, we've got to keep, we've got to cultivate, and we cannot allow those things of the world, we can't allow the things that are coming into our lives as Christians to choke us. Those thorns, those distractions, right? We've got to be ruthless against distractions. And by the way, some of those distractions are going to start out very small. They may seem, seem to be minor. They may seem to be minute. Well, you say, preacher, really isn't a big deal. That's how it starts. Angel, I was very careful about not missing church, right? 
we never miss church. Now, were you sick? Yeah. You had to work? Yeah. But we were ruthless. We were right there in the house of God. I mean, it, it, we never had a vacation, by the way, but if we come back from a long trip, we were there at church Sunday night. We did not allow anything to distract us. There was never a time when our kids were growing up did they ever ask us, are we going to church today? They knew that, and they still know it today, don't they? Our neighbors know it. And your neighbors know it as well. So that was the message today in a nutshell. But tonight I want to look at how we should grow to maturity in the Lord. You remember I said some weeks back that 95% of the Christians today in our churches have not reached maturity spiritually. 95% of the, of the folks in the churches today, and I'm even talking about Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches, they've not left the adolescent stage spiritually. And it's sad to say, we're talking 5% and maybe even less than 5% of Christians today are, are and have reached a level of maturity spiritually. So tonight I want to show you three things here. How we can grow to maturity in the Lord, okay? Look here, Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1. We know this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then, what's the next word, church? Holy, acceptable unto God. By the way, that's the God of the Bible, not the God in your imagination. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God that you've self-justified through your ways and sins. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And here's the message I want to look at tonight, verse number 2. And be not conformed to this world. There are a lot of things in the world that will choke. There are a lot of things in the world that will take the seed and, the, and they will devour it up. By the way, the Bible says that to be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking whom he may what? Devour. Same thing we see with the sower and the seed. That the fowls of the air came and devoured the seed. Taken away from their hearts. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That word transformed, we know this, it's the word metamorphosis. It's literally in, in, the, in the sense of a caterpillar forming into a butterfly. Or the world, uh, world theolo or the, the, the world theorist or whatever you want to call them, the scientists of the world. Uh, they say well, that's proof of evolution. No, it ain't evolution. Because that caterpillar just got wings. He's still a caterpillar. Amen? But there's that change. There should be a change in the Christian life. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by what? By the renewing of your... Boy, it all starts up there, doesn't it? Boy, I tell you what, it's not hard for the devil to get in your head. If he can do that to Jesus, wasn't successful, by the way, but he tried. He tried to get into the Lord's head, didn't he? Boy, after 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. Huh? And I, he came to the Lord, he tried to get into his head and said, Hey, hey, uh, if you worship me, I'll make these stones into bread. And I, and I, and if... And, 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 and this isn't in the Bible, but, but I, would, I would be sure to say that he even made those stones smell like bread. <laughs> I don't know, if, hey, as long as I fasted with 30 days, and, and listen, everything smelled good after 30 days. My goodness. I smelled bacon. Everywhere I went, I smelled bacon. Never was bacon, but everywhere I went, I smelled bacon. Hey, I was so hungry, sauerkraut probably would have tasted good. Amen. You get that in a minute. Some of y'all like, it does taste good. Not for me. Zucchini and squash would have probably tasted good. 
But you see, you see, he, he gets into your mind. And we have to renew our mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable. There's that word acceptable. And perfect, that's complete, will of God. So tonight here, let's pray. Tonight we're going to see how we can grow in the good ground, or I mean the maturity. Bless the Lord. We ask you, Lord, to bless the reading of your word tonight. I pray, Lord, you give me the power of the Holy Spirit as I preach your word. God, help me, Lord, to relay this message so that we can learn something tonight, Lord, that we can be strengthened, we can strengthen the brethren as we go out and combat this world. Bless those who are at home. Bless those who are sick. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, how do we grow to maturity? In the Lord. Now, folks, every one of us in this room, except for a, a couple of you, we all have kids, right? Or we, 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 we're around kids, nieces or nephews or whatever, right? And sometimes they, they act up, don't they? Well, most of the time. And, and, and every bit of us says there's got to be some maturity. How many of you deal with teenagers? And you think, yep, some immaturity, amen. Even young boys, immaturity. Well, even as Christians today, we ought to be mature. Far too many children in the churches today, adult children. And I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about those that don't know the Bible very well. I'm not talking about those. I'm not talking about maybe those who aren't very smart when it comes to the Word of God. I'm not talking about folks like that. I'm talking about those who act like children in the church. So how do we grow maturity in the Lord? Well, first of all, I want to show you here, there, there needs to be some commitments. One of the great problems that we're seeing amongst Christians, amongst the Christian circle and, and inside the church and, and, and among the church is the lack of commitment. Now, it's easy to preach to you guys tonight because you're here tonight. Amen. You're like, whoop, I ticked that one off the box. I'm committed. But I'm talking specifically about committed to what you do in the church. Are we committed? Someone said, well, why can't we do this or why can't we do that? I need some committed people. There was a time when it was looking like that we were going to start a bus route here in the church. Someone come to me and they said, hey, I want to start a bus ministry. You need to sit down. Here's what it entails. I could do it. Here's the responsibility you have. I can do it. Now, you're committed every week to do it. And I looked at him and I said, which means I'm not going to do it. I need to rely on somebody to be here every week to put together a program, to put together a schedule, to put together the responsibility to pick these children up every single week, and I don't want to have to do it. And when I said that, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can do that then. Well, there's got to be some commitment. Listen, we've got to be committed to Christ. You see, the Bible says, For the law made nothing perfect. But that bringing into a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. In Romans 10 verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's not just a verse for salvation, that's a verse for commitment. If you've confessed Christ as your personal Savior, you be committed to Him. I asked this question a couple weeks ago. I'm going to ask again. What if God only worked on Sunday? Huh? What if God was only committed in your life on Sunday morning for one hour? What if Christ was only committed in your life for one hour a week? See, how are, we, how are we supposed to grow in maturity? How are we to be mature in the Lord? We've got to be committed. 
You've got to have some commitment. I thank God for Miss Edna. She's committed. Amen. She's playing this piano every single week, three times a week. And she's here, and she's here throughout the week, not only working in the office, not only taking care of some things that really relieve the burden from me and Miss Angel because of the other things that we have to take care of, but she's in here practicing that piano. Probably every day, right? Just about. That's commitment. Commitment, even some of the small things. Commitment, listen, on Tuesday morning, we need somebody to put the trash out to the road so they can come get it. Every single Tuesday, and I don't want to have to worry about it. That's commitment. Somebody committed to come here early on a Sunday morning and make sure we have the, the air on or make sure we have coffee ready. Even some of those small things to be committed. We just need someone to be committed to Christ and committed to spiritual growth. You have to be committed to spiritual growth. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. And folks, it, it, it's so needed in our day today. He said, but refuse profane and old wise fables. We're to refuse those things. We're to refuse that, 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 that profane and those old wives' tales. And what we're to do, the Bible said, is we're to exercise thyself rather unto godliness. We ought to be growing spiritually with exercise. I preached a little bit about that this morning. To exercise. What is exercise? That means you've got to get some motion going, right? That means that takes a little bit of work. That means that takes a little bit of effort. That means that takes some commitment. See, January the 1st of every year, January the 1st of every year, you've got people that are committed to lose weight, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't ever see uh, Planet Fitness on the TV until that time of year. You never see the diet or the, the diet plans on TV until that time of year. You never see anything about Slim Fast until January the 1st and around the first part of the year. Why? Because there's those who are set out to exercise. There's those who say they're committed to lose weight. There's low, those who say they're committed and they join a gym and they join the YMCA and they spend $30 a month because they're committed. They're committed to exercise. Two months later, what happens? And a lot of cases, not even two months. You find yourself falling away because you're not exercising. And when it comes to exercise, right, Brother Johnny? You got to get up. Johnny walks three miles a day. That takes effort, that takes intention, that takes self motivation. Amen? And if we're to grow, if we're to, to grow to maturity in the Lord, we've got to be committed. We've got to be committed to Christ. We've got to be committed to His church. And we've got to be committed to grow, to have spiritual growth. We've got to grow in His grace. Peter said, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another a good stewards of manifold grace of God. The Bible says that we're to be good stewards. We're to grow in His love. Paul says, To the wit that God was, was, in, was in Christ reconciled the world unto Himself, not imputing their, own, their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be a reconciled to God, where to grow. There's commitment in that. Any kind of growth is going to be painful, right? Any kind of growth is painful. If it was so easy, thank you, brother, everybody would be doing it. 
And so not only, not, see, see, to grow in, in, in maturity, we've got to have some commitment. Number two, we're to grow in maturity through some of our circumstances. See, in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. This was the verse that I seen on that wall in the back. We glory in tribulation. Also knowing that tribulation worketh what? <whistles> Patience. I wonder sometimes, see, I ain't got no patience. That's right. That's the only time you're going to hear my wife shout something. I ain't got no patience. <laughs> I don't. It's just who I am, amen? Maybe that's why I got so much tribulation. Angel said, well, okay. <laughs> amen. <laughs> God can work miracles. But look, with tribulation then worketh patience. And patience, what? Experience. You see, with patience comes experience. Why is it that the older you get, the more wisdom you have? It's not wisdom, it's experience. I can honestly say, there's some things today that just don't bother me like they used to. Why? Because experience. People, some people don't bother me like they used to. I don't argue about the Bible anymore. I got experience. Didn't work, didn't, hadn't worked any other time. It's experience. I was talking with Robin today, and we were talking about, uh, he, he, he showed me a book that his neighbor had given him across the road, which was by Mary Baker Eddy, and she was the, the woman who started the Christian Science Church, Church of Christian Science. And, and her, her, when she started that church, she changed the, doc, the, the doctrines out of the Word of God and began to write her own books. And so in the church, they, yes, they say they use the Bible, but they also study her manuscripts more so. And I was talking to Robin, and I said, because he showed me the book, I said, nope, get rid of it, it's no good. As soon as I seen who the author was, I said, nope, get rid of it, it's no good. Because I said, one of the key things, there's two things that you find in any cult. In any cult, okay? And by the way, the Catholic Church is a cult. We always liken a cult to like Jim Jones, right? We always liken a, a cult to... To, to the Mormons or to someone who, is, who has taken people way out off to a distance and they've lived completely different and, they, and, they, and he's enclosed them into a compound. We, we look at Koresh as a cult. But the Catholic Church is a cult. And two things you find in a cult, and here's how you can identify a cult. Identify a cult. And I was telling him this today. I said two things you see. First of all, there's a new Bible. There's a new Bible. Oh, they say they use the Bible. They don't use the Bible. They use their own books, their own manuscripts. And number two, it's a different Jesus. Not the same Jesus of the Bible. And so again, that experience. And so with that experience, I said all to say this. I don't witness to Jehovah's Witnesses unless God compels me and there's an opportunity, right? But listen, by experience, they're not going to get saved. By experience. And so again, again, experience, uh, because, of, because of patience comes experience, and experience comes hope. Amen? See, through circumstances, circumstances try our faith, don't they? James says this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect entire and entire, wanting nothing. That's not that word perfect that we think. Again, as I said, that word perfect means complete. Some completion. That we may be complete and entire, wanting 
nothing. You see, those circumstances try our faith. They work our faith. They try our faith. Not only that, but they strengthen our faith. Paul says, I know both how to be abased. And he said, I know how to abound. He said, everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You see, those circumstances, it not only tries our faith, but it strengthens our faith. You know, we went through a process, what I call a necessary evil called deputation. And we experienced, and I was told, hey, listen, you'll experience some things on deputation that you will experience on the mission field. And he's exactly right. And see, not only did it try our faith, but it also strengthened. Because I'm going to tell you, three weeks, three weeks, that's one, two, three, right? After we got in the country, we were just about to start our third service in the church. And we had a group of people come through that front door to remove us physically from the country. I seen them come through. I knew something wasn't right. If looks can kill, we'd all been dead. But you know what? That ain't the first time we've been through that, was it? And we experienced those things. And look, I had enough grit. I well, I'm probably stubbornness more than I could. But I had enough grit that I told them, I said, look. Y'all can do whatever you want with this building. You can do whatever you want with the name of this church. But I'm going to take half these people. And we're going to have church in my house. Because I didn't move. I do this country to move back to America with my tail between my legs. We're going to have church. And I told them just like that. I mean, it was bad. Right, Angel? We had two women going at it. Throwing fists at each other. One woman looked at another woman and said, Get behind me, Satan. That woman reared back. Threw a punch at her, she ducked and hit another woman. Then the other woman said, why'd you hit me for? Next thing that we knew, it was all, it was, fight was on. And we had two other men jumping around like they were going to fight. Talking about leprechauns and milking cows. <laughs> and we were sitting, and I was just, I just sitting back like this. And I had one lady glared at me, staring at me. She looked at me and she goes, how can you sit there with that smug look on your face? I looked at her and I said, I'm here to serve God. I don't know what y'all are doing. And one by one, they got up and left. And we had church in that building for five years. A lot of times it was just one person there. But for five years, we had church. You see, those things strengthen our faith. And then number three, circumstances bonds our faith. Here's what David said. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now, I, now have I kept thy word. It bonds you, strengthens you. Bind us together, Lord, with strings that cannot be broken. I began to sing that in that church. Right after that whole big fight, right after that whole big... And I'm not kidding you, it was three weeks... Right, three weeks that we were in the country. Listen, we didn't know how to pay our bills in three weeks. I had just, matter of fact, I was so excited I got myself a little cell phone. A little one, a little Nokia looking thing. And here they come in that door. You're out of here. It wasn't going to happen. They kick us out of a building, but listen, the church ain't just the building. It's the body of believers, amen? And circumstances confirms our faith. Here's what Job says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knows. 
And, and, and folks, we have to keep telling ourselves that, right? He knows. He knows the ways we take. He knows those things. And as Job says that we have to, as, he, as we're tried, we have to come forth as gold. What does that mean? Why did Job, listen, why did Job say the words tried and the word gold? Why is that? Gold is tried in the fire. You realize whenever you see the presence of God in the Bible, it's always likened unto fire. Did Mo, what did Moses see in the backside of the desert? A bush on fire. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, where did they see the Lord? Where did Nebuchadnezzar see the Lord? In the fire. As Moses was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness, by night, what did he lead the children by? By fire. And by day, the Bible says... By a pillar of clouds, which was the smoke from the fire. And then they, they know that, and the presence of God is likened to a fire, because the children of Israel, they, they create this calf, and they're dancing around the fire. And what did Aaron say? It just jumped out of the fire like it was God. We come to this here tonight. That our faith, listen, how do we grow in maturity in the Lord? It's through our circumstances. Look, circumstances tries our faith. And when our faith is tried, we shall come forth as gold. How do you purify gold? Put it in the fire. One time? Huh? Is it one time? No. Several times. How, and, and, and it's not just one time or two times or three times. Each, 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 each pile of gold or flakes of gold, I guess, are different. In the same way in your life, you've got a different measure of faith. And look, sometimes it takes more fire to work on you than it does somebody else. Because you've got more impurities in your life. And so when you're trying that gold, and, and when does the goldsmith know? When does the silversmith know that that gold or that silver is ready to be pulled from the fire? When does he know that? Until he sees his own image. So he pulls away that impurity. He looks at it and said, nope, still got some more. Throw it back in the fire. He pulls it out of the fire. He begins to pour it. It begins to cool off. And he doesn't see his image. And he throws away that, that, all the impurities. And he puts it back in the fire. And he's pulling more impurities out of you. And he's pulling more impurities out of you. Listen, it tries our faith. If we're to grow in maturity in the Lord, there's going to be some circumstances. I just don't understand why God is allowing bad things to happen. You must have a lot of impurities. You know what that means? I must have a lot of impurities. Because we've been through it, through it, haven't we? We were talking about that this morning. My goodness. Some of the things that we've been through, and, and, and as soon as we surrender to serve God, it started happening. So, to grow and mature in the Lord, it's through our commitment, circumstance. The last thing here, and I'm done, is through challenges. The Bible says iron sharpeneth what? Iron. You're not going to sharpen your knife amongst a, a piece of wood, are you? You've got to find something as equal to that strength or harder than the strength of that knife. Listen, you can't sharpen. By the way, somebody said, well, you can use a piece of leather. No, 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 no. Leather does not sharpen. Leather just kind of uh, cleans it up a bit. We had that in the butcher shop. I had a piece of steel. I, I, it was hanging on my side, and every once in a while, whoosh, 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 and I'd whip out that knife, and I began to work that knife on the steel. It was not sharpening my knife. It was just taking off the little burrs. 
in order to sharpen that knife, I had to pull out that stone. And I had to put some oil on that stone, and I began to run that knife, uh, that knife uh, uh, into the blade. I just began to sharpen that knife, and I wanted that knife super sharp. And I began to work that knife. And I've got a set of knives that are probably 40 years old, and some of them are just barely even a knife because they've been sharpened so many times. And see, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. What does it challenge us here? Two things I'm done. It challenges the believer's ferventness. The ferventness. Paul says, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the days shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. It's the fire that's going to try you. The difficulties are going to try you. These commitments, these circumstances, these hard times, the, the, the not so feel good times. You see, manifest is to openly challenge the true grit of the believer. How much grit do you have? How strong are you? Three years ago, we seen a lot of Christians quit going to church. They were afraid they were going to die. They were afraid they were going to get sick. Hey, it wasn't a month before that. We were shaking hands and wiping our noses. We were sniffing and snorting and hugging each other. Next thing you know, here comes a virus. And we all run. And we got ugly with each other, didn't we? I mean, just, just right out, just right out, mean and ugly. Don't come around me. Don't get more than, uh, don't, don't get less than six feet. What, what's six feet? Why not five feet? Why not ten feet? Don't get any less than six feet from me. I don't want to get this virus, and I don't want to get it from you because you're spreading it. How am I spreading it? Well, you know you can have it and not know it. How is that? And look, and we came against each other. We battled each other and we fought each other right here in the church. And listen, the Bible says there should be some grit about the believer. And there wasn't. Well, you better have a mask on. You're going to come around me. What's that going to do? What's the mask going to stop? What's the six feet part is going to stop? And listen, and we thought we were safe because of six feet. You get less than six feet, whoa, we're in trouble now. See, it challenges the believer's ferventness. Again, manifest is to openly challenge the true grit of the believer. And the last thing is challenges the believer's faithfulness. Boy, we really think we're faithful, don't we? We are until hard times come. We are until we get mad at the preacher. We are until we get upset because somebody hurts your feelings. Where's the manifest? Where's the grit? See, Peter says this, and here's where I'm going to close. He said, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, I, I love this. By the way, when you're reading the Bible, you ought to just slow down and read it. Amen. Because <laughs> there's some good stuff in there. Again, the language of Peter here, he said, We're in ye, talking to the church, talking to believers. He said, Ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. 
He said, you're greatly rejoiced. And by the way, when things are going good, when things are going great, you'll rejoice. Woo, God is good, amen. I got a million, I got $500,000 in the bank. Woo, God is good, amen. Woo, God is good. I won the lottery. Shouldn't be playing it. Woo, God is good, amen. Somebody came by and gave me a $5. Whoop, God is good. Somebody came and paid my bill. Whoop, God is good. I was in the restaurant and they said, your bill's paid for. Ain't God good. Yep, until somebody gets sick. You know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why God's, why God's doing this. Huh? I don't know why God's doing this. Boy, the devil working on me. I don't know why God don't take care of it. He said, you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be. He said, you, ye are heaviness through manifold temptations. He said, you're in heaviness through manifold, manifold temptation. That the trial of your faith. What's a trial? I mean, we all know what a trial is, right? That's right. The trial of your faith. You ever, you ever been to a trial? You ever been in a trial? <laughs> maybe you're trying to. <laughs> maybe maybe you're trying to uh, 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 defend yourself in a trial. It's not fun, is it? Everything's exposed, right? All your strengths and all your weaknesses, they're exposed. And he says here that the trials of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. We talked about that gold being tried in the fire. He pulls away the impurity. He looks and said, nope, can't see myself. He throws you back in the fire. He pulls away the impurities. Nope, I can't see myself. And he throws you back in the fire and he gets rid of all the impurities. And listen, here's what Peter is saying. He said, the trials of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know what Peter just said here? Wins it over. Peter, when's the trial over? Peter, when's the trouble over? Peter, when, when's the, when, when is the, the fire no longer going to, to try me anymore? Peter, when's it over? When's it done? What does he say? When Jesus comes back. See, if we're to grow in maturity, there's going to be some challenges. Bible says manifold is defined as many folds or multiples. Not just multiple in temptation, but various in character. You know what that means? That means they're going to come in every situation, in every way. They're going to try you. Probably one of the hardest times that we went through it was 2017. I told you that. I said uh, three weeks after being in the country, right? Here, being in the country, I don't, I don't, we don't have the Constitution to protect us. We, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to pay the bills. We don't have to go, go uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is. We don't, we, don't, we don't know where to even go to get groceries. We don't even have a bank account, did we? Because in order for me to get a bank account, I had to get a bill in my name. So that's why I went and got the cell phone. But I couldn't get the cell phone because I didn't have a bank account. So I got one of those little cell phones to try to build my credit. And three weeks into that, got to go. Got to get out of here. We're kicking you out of the country. You're going, I'm like, hey, you're leaving nowhere. Y'all, I didn't spend all this time and all this effort and energy to be listening to you. Y'all go on. If you want to stay here, I'll take half of these people. We're going to my house. Well, they looked at me and said, well, I guess he made up his mind. You're darn right I made up my mind. All the crying and going on, angels like, oh, I want to go home and all that. You know what? That's, it was trying. It was trying what? It was a challenge. 
But five years later, well, six years later, we took a church in, in Norfolk. And they kicked us out. Not only did they kick us out, they, they changed the locks on the door. Took my name off the church sign. This all in one day, by the way. Told all the church members that the heater is broke. And we're not going to have service until they fix the heater. Somebody called me. I went right up to the church before they ch changed the locks. And I turned the heater on. I said, the heater ain't clear. What in the world? It's not broke. So they knew they couldn't stop me there because I had a church service that night. It was on Wednesday night. So then they changed locks on the door, took my name off the sign, and issued me a no trespassing order that I was to not be on the property nor hold any services until a meeting is conducted. About two or three weeks, probably three weeks later, they finally have a meeting to vote me out. Because I told them, I said, look, if it takes a vote to vote me in, it's going to take some votes to vote me out. I said, look. So they issued a no trespassing order. I got a call from the lawyer that the, somebody in the church hired against me. And he said, what in the world is this? I've never been hired against a pastor. And I told the man, he said, the lawyer says, why don't you resign? I said, nope, they're going to vote me out. Okay. Three weeks later, they hold a meeting. My two children come and they kicked them out of the building. And we moved here to Virginia. I, don't, I didn't even really know where Virginia was on the map. Just a year ago, we were, we were just left a country. Seeking what God wants to do. That's when I was working in the prison. And after that, we came to Norfolk. We were so excited about starting a little church. And it was a little white church on Glen Rock Road. We were so excited about it. We started knocking doors in the neighborhood. And the church says, we don't want you to reach people in our neighborhood. We don't want them in our church. And I wonder sometimes, why did we go through that? Why did God allow us to go through that? We move all the way from Georgia to Virginia, where we're not familiar with. Five months later, you got to go. Why? See, it's to challenge us. It's to strengthen us. And I told angels through it all. I said, remember, we've been through this before. We've been through it before. See, how do we grow maturity in the Lord? It's by the things that we're committed to. Are you committed? It's through our circumstances. Nicole, you didn't know why God moved you to Suffolk. You didn't want to come here, did you? Nope. And you didn't realize... That me and Angel and the, and, the, and the realtor sitting in that yard that you're living in, praying over it. Just a few months before you guys moved in, didn't even know you. As soon as Robert come in, I seen Robert, he come through here, he sat right over there. He told me he told me he moved in Jackson. I said, did you move in that double wide on Jackson? He goes, how did you know that? I said, because we were going to. It's the circumstance, you didn't know that. We don't know what's going. We don't know what tomorrow is, but that's where we've got to grow. And it's through these challenges that we're going to grow, folks. Our church is going through some challenges, and we pray that we can grow through it. Amen. With some experience, let's pray. Thank you.